Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, so in the previous video what we talked about was structural diversity amongst G-protein coupled receptors. So we talked about how the extracellular domain made up from the amino terminal domain and the three extracellular loops, along with um, the extracellular portions of the transmembrane uh, regions. Uh, that is the portion of the G-protein coupled receptor that generally has the most diversity among different examples. And that's because that's the portion that's going to bind the ligands generally. Okay, And since many different G-protein coupled receptors have different ligands and therefore need to bind, uh, well, need to have different uh, binding pockets for those ligands, that makes sense that those portions should have to have quite a lot of diversity. We then talked about how the intracellular portions of the G-protein coupled receptor, so the intracellular domain made up of the uh, three intracellular loops and the um, intracellular portions of the transmembrane regions, that is generally more conserved because these are the regions that are going to be uh, interacting with heterotrimeric G proteins and other signaling molecules and therefore um, since there is quite a limited number, a relatively limited number of heterotrimeric G proteins compared to the vast number of G protein coupled receptors, it makes sense that that portion needs to be a little bit more conserved. Okay, right. We then talked about this classical model of activation for G-protein coupled receptors, where the G-protein coupled receptors can only exist in two states, either inactive or active. Now, although this isn't correct, okay, it's not strictly speaking correct, it can exist in more states than that, and we'll talk more about that when we come on to biased agonism. Okay, it's a very uh, nice, simple, useful model, and it gets across the concept uh, which is that there some G-protein coupled receptors have a basal activity, i.e. a proportion of them will already be in the active state, uh, even without any ligand applied, basically. Okay, um, And that means that the G-protein coupled receptor can be activating signaling pathways at a basal level. Okay, And that's important for understanding what the concept of an inverse agonist is, which is this drug which will reduce the basal activity by favoring the movement of the G-protein coupled receptor back into the inactive state, and therefore shifting the equilibrium towards the inactive state. Okay, right, so in this video what we're going to talk about now is activation of G-protein coupled receptors. What actually changes between the inactive and the active state? And the amazing thing here is that we think actually very broad changes are conserved in different G-protein coupled receptors. Specifically, there is one change that seems to have been conserved in all of the different G-protein coupled receptors that we have found the activation mechanism of so far. So let me tell you which G-protein coupled receptors the activation mechanism has been worked out for. Okay, so these are the three ones that we have currently managed to work out how they are activated and what actual conformational changes occur when they're activated. So obviously rhodopsin, the most highly studied of all of them. Okay, but there are two others as well, which are the A2A adenosine receptor Okay, which is a receptor for adenosine. Okay, so adenine bound to ribose but with no phosphates bound to it. Okay, and then also the beta 2 adrenergic receptor. Okay, beta 2, and I'll call it beta 2 AR for adrenergic receptor. Okay, so these are some very important examples of G protein coupled receptors, and these are the ones that we've managed to work out the activation mechanism of so far. So I just want to tell you a little bit more about these receptors then. So we've discussed rhodopsin. Rhodopsin uh, consists of a G protein coupled receptor known as the opsin receptor, and I'll just draw this here, okay, like so. So here it is. Here is this seven. Uh, helix bundle spanning the membrane like so. And then you'll have the central cavity in the middle there. Okay, and then we'll split it up into the seven membrane spanning alpha helices one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, uh, and basically uh, the actual G protein coupled receptor before it has anything bound to it is just known as the opsin. Okay. 
And then what happens is it gets loaded with 11 cis retinal, okay, this molecule, uh, and then that is known as rhodopsin, basically, once the opsin has the 11 cis retinal bound to it. However, the 11 cis retinal does not cause the uh, opsin molecule to go into the active state. In fact, uh, the 11 cis retinal is actually an inverse agonist. If you take an opsin receptor, uh, and look at the fraction of opsin receptors that are normally in the inactive and active state, uh, then if you add 11 cis retinal onto the opsins, it actually favours it in the inactive state. Okay, so I don't know the exact proportions for opsin, but we can imagine that uh, with just opsin G protein coupled receptors, and usually 90% of them are in the inactive state and 10% are in the active state, then if you add the 11 cis retinal to the opsin molecules, it actually goes in favor of the inactive state. So it might move up to 95% being in the inactive state and only 5% being in the active state. I imagine that it's much more extreme like that than that. It will probably be more like 100% will be in the inactive state and 0% or at least something ridiculously negligible will be in the active state state uh, because you don't want rhodopsin activating spontaneously because um, this is the eye, remember, you don't want to be seeing things that aren't there. Okay, right. Um, so, then what happens is when light hits 11 cis retinal within the rhodopsin, so it will be bound deep within this binding pocket here, when the photons hit 11 cis retinal, they call, cause it to photoisomerase. Uh, into all trans retinal. Okay, so retinal has a huge number of double bonds in it, and in the 11 cis retinal, all the other double bonds are in the trans isomer, but the 11th double bond is in the cis isomer. Now, when a photon hits it, that uh, 11, that double bond on the 11th carbon uh, turns into the trans conformation and therefore uh, it becomes all trans retinal. And all trans retinal is then an agonist of the opsin receptor. It's going to uh, then move this equilibrium in favor of the active form and hence then the rhodopsin receptors are going to activate downstream heterotrimeric G proteins and we'll see which heterotrimeric G proteins are going to be activated later on. And again I'll just mention that the amino terminal domain of uh, rhodopsin actually again forms a lid over the top of the rhodopsin because uh, 11 cis retinal and all trans retinal they are actually very lipid soluble so they enter from the lipid membrane like we saw for the sphingosine 1 phosphate type 1 receptor. Okay, right. So, then let me just mention aden adenosine 2A receptors. Okay, so uh, these are uh, more normal than this one, okay? It doesn't have the ligand pre-bound and then it has to change into something else, no. Uh, this is just a G-protein coupled receptor that combines a ligand and its ligand is adenosine, okay? So this is the adenosine 2A receptor. Okay, and for the beta-2 adrenergic receptor, the ligand is then uh, either noradrenaline, which I'll just abbreviate down to NA, or adrenaline. And if you're in the States, then the noradrenaline is called norepinephrine, and adrenaline is called epinephrine. Okay, right, and again, these are agonists, they will favour uh, the active state, so they will switch the equilibrium, or at least push the equilibrium towards the active state to increase the amount of signalling downstream. Okay, right, so these are the three types of uh, G-protein coupled receptor which we have found the activation mechanism for. Okay, now the important thing to note here is that absolutely all of these are in that same family of G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, they're all in the rhodopsin family of G-protein coupled receptors and they all bind their ligand in this ligand binding pocket that is in the cavity uh, within the ring of seven membrane spanning alpha helices. Okay, right. So what we're now going to discuss is how uh, these G-protein coupled receptors activate, what shared features do they all have, okay? And um, what we then want to look at is how does the ligand binding actually cause that conformational change? Okay, so let me just get another piece of paper.
Okay, right. So before we just do that, I need to mention some, some uh, conserved motifs that you find in G-protein coupled receptors that are actually going to be important in the change in conformation that leads to the activation of the G-protein coupled receptor. Okay, right. So these motifs that I'm about to mention, they are found in um, most rhodopsin receptors, a good fraction of the rhodopsin family receptors. And since we're talking only about activation, really, of rhodopsin family receptors, because those are the only ones we actually know what happens uh, within, okay, uh, this is relevant. So most rhodopsin family members have these conserved motifs. Okay, uh, so I'll stress that again, uh, that what we know about the activation is all about the rhodopsin family of G-protein coupled receptors. We don't know what it is for the other uh, G-protein coupled receptors at present. Maybe it's the same mechanism, but we don't know. Okay, right. This mechanism that I'm about to go through, uh, we think is conserved for all rhodopsin family uh, members. At least it's conserved for the rhodopsin, the adenosine 2A, uh, and the beta 2 adrenoreceptor. And those are quite different receptors. Okay, they may all be in the rhodopsin family, but they're kind of spaced around in the rhodopsin family. So we hope that the mechanism might be conserved for all rhodopsin family G protein coupled receptors. Okay, right, so let me talk about these conserved motifs that are going to be important. So the first motif that I want to talk about is a motif that is written as the dairy motif, or just the dry motif, some people call it. Okay, so what does this mean then? Basically, this is a motif that you can find in transmembrane helix 3, okay, so TM3, and it consists of three amino acids. An aspartic acid residue, okay, that's what D, the single letter amino acid code D, is for aspartic acid, okay, and this aspartic acid residue is at 3, it's in helix number 3, and then point 49. So I'm using now the uh, Ballesteros Weinstein numbering system that we discussed in the previous video, where the first number tells you what helix it's in, and this tells you what uh, residue, uh, well, where it is relative to that most conserved residue. Okay, and remember we're talking about rhodopsin family G protein coupled receptors, so the most conserved residues are set for all rhodopsin family G protein coupled receptors. We're not going outside of that family. Okay, so aspartate at position, well, in helix 3 at position 49, and this could also be a glutamic acid. Usually it's an aspartate there, but some rhodopsin family members have a glutamic acid there, so 3.49. So either aspartic acid or glutamic acid, and E is the um, single letter code for uh, glutamic acid, so that's why we've got D brackets E. It means this is either a D or it's an E. Okay, right. Then after that amino acid, we've got the arginine, okay, which is has its single letter code R, okay, and this is arginine 3.50 now. Okay, this is the most conserved residue in helix number three for all rhodopsin family members. Okay, uh, so we determine what the number for all the other residues in helix number three relative to this arginine for rhodopsin family members. Okay, and then finally, um, the final amino acid in this, little um, in this little motif is a tyrosine, again in helix number three, and this is at position 51 relative to our uh, most conserved residue in that helix. Okay, right. Uh, so let me just draw a picture then of my G-protein coupled receptor so I can show you where this motif is actually going to be. Okay, so again, here is this seven helix bundle. Okay, here's the cavity in the middle. And here's the first membrane spanning alpha helix, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh. Okay, so I'll split it up here. Right, uh, so you then have the amino terminal domain here. You then have that extracellular loop 1 between TM2 and TM3, and then TM3 moves its way down like so. So basically, this D uh, brackets E RY motif, this will be uh, on, on the third membrane spanning alpha helix as we're going down, okay? So if I draw this helix out then, okay, like so, okay, as it goes through the membrane, you will find 
uh, this D E R Y motif somewhere uh, on here, basically. So you'll find it going down, basically. So the D slash E uh, will be the uh, first residue, and then you'll have another residue which will be the R and they'll have another residue which will be the tyrosine. So my point with this picture is really to show you that um, the, this sequence is going down the helix because TM3 uh, is directed downwards, the D slash E R Y motif will be going downwards. Okay, right. Now, there is usually a salt bridge in this motif when the receptor is in the inactive form, okay? And this salt bridge is going to be between either the aspartic acid or the glutamate residue and then the arginine residue, this most conserved residue. So let me just draw this out for you. Okay, so let's now draw out the sequence of free amino acids that's going to be in this third membrane spanning alpha helix. Okay, so we will assume that our first residue is indeed going to be an aspartate. It is in most rhodopsin family members. It's more common that it is an aspartate than a glutamic acid. Okay, right. So here is the amino group. Here's the alpha carbon. Here's the carboxylic acid group. That's just the core amino acid structure of this first amino acid. And now we want to draw aspartate. So here's a methylene group. Okay, and here is the carboxylic acid group. Now, basically, um, aspartic acid has usually donated its proton away. Okay, in normal physiological pH, aspartic acid will not have its proton here, and therefore it's called aspartate. Okay, so that's what the strict difference between aspartic acid and aspartate is. Aspartate means aspartic acid without the proton on here. Okay, so you have a negative charge on that oxygen instead. Okay, aspartic acid means the actual amino acid when you have the proton still attached to that oxygen. Okay, so aspartate, uh, using the fancy chemistry nomenclature, is the conjugate base of aspartic acid. Okay, right, so that's got a negative charge is the important thing to note here. Then if we draw the next amino acid along, which is the arginine, here's the amino group. Here's the alpha carbon with a hydrogen coming off it. Here's the carboxylic acid group. And then in the case of arginine, you have three methylene groups. And I'll just draw one methylene group, put a bracket around it, and then put three to mean repeat that three times. Okay. Then you've got a nitrogen with a hydrogen coming off it. And then a carbon with a, a double bond to a nitrogen, which then has a hydrogen coming off it. And then also an amino group here. Like so. Now, basically, this nitrogen here that has the double bond uh, to the carbon, uh, this also has a lone pair of electrons, and this lone pair of electrons can get a proton from solution, potentially the proton from this oxygen, or just a proton from solution, uh, binding to it there, and therefore it ends up with a positive charge. So, end up with a positive charge here, okay, and a negative charge here. And basically, these are going to uh, form uh, an ionic link, basically, an electrostatic interaction. And this sort of an interaction is called a salt bridge. And basically, in the activation process, this salt bridge is going to break. And the arginine is going to be very important in binding to the heterotrimeric G protein, as we'll see later on. Okay, right. Uh, so just to complete the uh, DRY motif up then, uh, we'll put the final amino acid on here, which isn't involved in the salt bridge, but I'll put it on anyway, okay, which is the tyrosine residue. Okay, so once again, there's the uh, core amino acid structure. And then tyrosine's R group is a methylene group uh, with a benzene ring coming off the side here, and then an alcohol group coming off the benzene ring. So this is D here, this is R here, and this is Y here. This is the DRY motif. Okay, which in some Rhodopsin family members will be the ERY motif rather than the DRY motif. It's exactly the same principle in the ERY motif. Basically, you'll have an um, additional methylene group here, but you've still got the carboxylic acid group in uh, glutamate. And in glutamate, you have again lost the proton here. Okay, so glutamate is again the conjugate base of glutamic acid. And therefore, you'll have a negative charge here, uh, and that will bind with the positive charge on the arginine forming this uh, salt bridge between those two residues.
Okay, right. So that's usually a feature of all inactive uh, rhodopsin family G protein coupled receptors that you have this salt bridge on uh, transmembrane helix number three. Okay, right. So one more little uh, conserved motif to talk about before we actually go on to the activation mechanism itself. And this is the motif NPXXY, which is present in helix number seven. So NPXXY in TM7. Okay, right. So going back to our picture, TM7, remember, is this one coming down here. So again, it's another helix that is going down. So again, this motif will be going down. You'll have M, then you'll have P, then you'll have X, X, Y, basically. Okay, so what does this motif stand for? Well, again, you need to know single letter amino acid code to interpret this. Okay, so the N uh, is for the single letter, sorry, it's for the amino acid asparagine, uh, the three letter code for which is ASN. So asparagine is aspartic acid, but with an amino group bound to the carboxylic acid group. So basically, imagine aspartic acid, but with a primary amide group here. So take off this and put an amino group there. That's then asparagine. Okay, and this asparagine that you've got here is in helix number seven, and relative to the most conserved residue, it is 49. So it's the amino acid prior to the most conserved residue. So that means that this proline uh, here is the most conserved residue in helix number seven for a dopsin family G protein coupled receptors. Okay, right, then after that, you've got the proline in helix number seven, and that's 0.50, that's the most conserved residue. Then you've got two residues that we don't know what they are, okay? So for different G-protein coupled receptors in the rhodopsin family, this varies hugely, basically. So then you've got X, which is in position 7.51, X, which is in position 7.52, and those can be anything, basically. And now, the final residue here that's conserved in nearly all rhodopsin family G-protein coupled receptors is tyrosine, helix number seven, and then it's in position 53 relative to the most conserved residue of helix number seven. Okay, so it's this tyrosine 7.53 that we're going to be interested in, basically. Okay. Um, this residue in the inactive receptor is usually pointing out towards uh, TM1. So it's normally pointing towards TM1, which is here, okay? When the receptor activates, this tyrosine residue spins into the middle, basically. The R group of this tyrosine residue goes from pointing to, at TM1 to pointing into the central axis of the seven helix bundle, basically. Okay, and that's one of the important changes that occur in G-protein coupled receptors when the G-protein coupled receptors activate. Okay, so let's now go through the major changes that occur when a G-protein coupled receptor activates. Okay, because we've come across these little things here now. We've come across this uh, breaking of the salt bridge and this tyrosine rotating into the center, but there is one absolutely major change that occurs that uh, I need to stress now. Okay, so let's go over onto the other side and draw a G-protein coupled receptor again, and then we'll highlight what changes actually occur when the G-protein coupled receptor activates. Okay, so here is the membrane once again, and then sitting in the membrane you're going to have your 7 helix bundle here. Okay, like so. So here is the 7 helix bundle once again, the uh, central cavity here, and then you've got the seven membrane spanning alpha helices, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven there. Okay, right, and now what I'm going to do is with my purple pen, I'm going to highlight where the different helices are at least. In fact, I'll finish the membrane firstly. So here's the membrane continuing on here. Okay, and I'm gonna highlight the ones that we can see. So here's the amino terminus here. Then you've got the extracellular loop between TM2 and TM3. Then you've got extracellular loop 2 between TM4 uh, here and TM5. Then you've got the intracellular loop uh, 3 between TM5 and TM6. Extracellular loop 3 between TM6 and TM7. And then we've got 
the carboxylic acid terminus down here. Okay, right. So what are the major changes that occur when a G-protein coupled receptor activates? Well, the crucial change, okay, and if you're going to learn one change which occurs when G-protein coupled receptors activate, this is the one to learn. Okay, the crucial change that we believe is conserved across all rhodopsin family G-protein coupled receptors is a change in transmembrane helix number 5 here, which I'll write in Roman numerals to be fancy and then transmembrane uh, helix number six here. These are the critical two. Basically what happens is when the G-protein coupled receptor activates, the bottom portions of these helices, the cytoplasmic portions of these helices, moves outwards along with intracellular loop three here. So this whole bottom portion here opens up basically, it moves outwards and that opens up a crevice, or that's what it's believed to do. It opens up a crevice into the bottom of the seven helix bundle here. And indeed what's going to happen is the C-terminal portion of the alpha subunit of heterotrimeric G proteins is going to come along and stick itself into that crevice. And that's one of the major parts of binding of the uh, heterotrimeric G protein to the activated G protein coupled receptor. So that is the major change. The swinging outward of uh, transmembrane helix 5 and transmembrane helix 6. Okay, to give a few more changes that have been found in the rhodopsin, the adenosine 2A um, adenosine receptor, and the beta 2 adrenergic receptor, but which differ in their uh, extremeness between those different ones, i.e. this mechanism that I've just set, said here, uh, 5 and 6 swinging out, that's obvious for all three of the main ones that we've worked out the activation mechanism for. Okay, The mechanisms that I'm about to say, in some it's an obvious change that occurs, a striking change that occurs, but in others it's not so striking. Okay, So um, it's a little bit more debated how important these final ones that I'm going to tell you about now are. Okay, so, basically, the other changes that have been noted is that transmembrane helix number 3 moves upwards, okay, so TM3 moves upwards, and also TM7 moves a little bit inwards, okay, so here is 7 moving inwards, and this is 3 moving upwards, so those are other changes that have been noted, but as I say, in different G-protein coupled receptors, the strikingness of these two other changes varies, basically, whereas in all of them, the outward movement of 5 and 6 at their cytoplasmic ends is very, very striking, so we think that's the most important change that occurs, and we think that's conserved for all rhodopsin family G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, then uh, to note once again those changes that I told you about with those conserved residues, in transmembrane helix number 3, the salt bridge between the aspartic acid or glutamic acid residue uh, and the arginine residue is going to break basically, okay, and that's going to leave that arginine 3.50 ready to interact with uh, the heterotrimeric G protein. So the arginine 3.50 is now going to be facing into the central axis of the 7 helix bundle. And basically, when the C terminal um, portion of the heterotrimeric G protein inserts in, that's involved in binding to that alpha subunit of the heterotrimeric G protein. Okay, in addition, in the MPXXY motif, uh, the tyrosine that was previously facing TM1 spins into the middle, and that may also play an important role in binding to the heterotrimeric G protein. Okay, so those then are the changes which are believed to underlie the movement from this inactive state to the active state of the G protein coupled receptor. Okay, right. So, now what I just briefly want to talk about is how does ligand binding actually cause these conformational changes? Well, this is where obviously the answer varies for all different G-protein coupled receptors because um, G-protein coupled receptors all bind different ligands, they all have different residues lining their binding sites, uh, so clearly the way that ligand binding actually causes this change in the intracellular portions of the transmembrane um, 
regions uh, is going to be different, okay? But I'm going to tell you about a mechanism that has been found uh, for both the adenosine 2A receptor and also the rhodopsin receptor, but it's not the same mechanism that's found in the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. So just in the three that we have seen so far, we've already uh, found discrepancy, basically. But the mechanism that I'm about to mention is important in the adenosine 2A adenosine receptor and also in rhodopsin. Okay, and it's what is known as the rotomer toggle uh, switch. Okay, right, so this basically involves a tryptophan residue, okay, uh, in transmembrane helix uh, number six, okay, so this is the rotomer toggle switch. Okay, so it's time for another conserved motif that's found in many, many rhodopsin family G protein coupled receptors, and this conserved motif is going to be in transmembrane uh, helix six this time, okay, and this conserved motif is the motif CWXP, okay, uh, and what this stands for is cysteine, the W is for tryptophan, the X is then for any amino acid, and the P is for proline. Okay, so, uh, let me tell you what the uh, Ballesteros-Weinstein notation for this then is. So the C is for cysteine, and this is in helix number 6, and then it's at position 47 relative to the most conserved amino acid residue. So now what you can do is work out what the most conserved amino acid residue in helix number 6 for rhodopsin family G protein coupled receptors is. Okay, then you've got tryptophan after that, and again its notation would be 6.48 now. Then you'd have X, which would be 6.49. And then finally, proline, which is the most conserved residue for uh, transmembrane helix number six in all rhodopsin family G protein coupled receptors, and is there for uh, 6.50. Right, so this motif CWXP is in transmembrane helix number six, and therefore, since transmembrane helix number six is moving upwards, this motif works its way upwards, so the cysteine is closest to the bottom, then you have the tryptophan getting higher, the X, and then the proline, so it's going upwards, whereas the other two motifs that we've seen, the DRY and the MPXXY motif, they were on downwardly going uh, membrane spanning alpha helices. Okay, right, so it's this tryptophan that's believed to be very important, basically, in the adenosine 2A adrene uh, sorry, adenosine receptor and the rhodopsin receptor, okay? So basically what's believed to happen is when the ligand binds, either it's all transretinal or it's adenosine, when the ligand binds in this ligand binding pocket here, that's believed to cause a rotation of this key tryptophan, tryptophan 6.48, which has its R group um, oriented into the ligand binding pocket. Okay, so when um, the ligand bind, it, ca it causes a rotation of this residue, hence why it's called rotomer. Okay, so the tryptophan rotates, and that's believed then to cause this outward movement of um, transmembrane helix 5 and 6 towards their cytoplasmic aspect. The change in the conformation of the tryptophan up here Okay, it's believed to then trigger uh, the movement of the bottom portions of transmembrane helix 5 and 6 outwards, and therefore is believed to trigger the activation of those uh, rhodopsin family G protein coupled receptors. Okay, so that's what is understood of the activation mechanisms of G protein coupled receptors then. Okay, the key change is that when the ligand binds, whether for a rotomer toggle switch mechanism or not, the membrane spanning alpha helix 5 and 6 at the cytoplasmic aspect move out, and this makes a crevice available for the binding of secondary signaling molecules that are on the intracellular aspect. Okay, right, so now what we want to do is begin our uh, discussion of the secondary signaling molecules, okay, and the famous ones for G-protein coupled receptors, the ones after which the entire family of receptors is named, is the heterotrimeric G-proteins. So those are the signaling molecules that we're going to start off with. 
Okay, so now we're going to have an in-depth discussion of hetero trimeric G protein. So we're going to build this up gradually. So we're going to start off with a very basic picture of heterotrimeric G proteins, then we'll progress up to a more advanced picture of heterotrimeric G proteins, and then finally we'll actually look at the structure of an alpha subunit of a heterotrimeric G protein, and we'll do that so that we can actually uh, understand the conformational changes that the alpha subunit undergoes uh, when it binds to the G protein coupled receptor. Okay, right, so firstly, heterotrimeric G proteins then. As their name suggests, they are made up of three different uh, subunits. Trimer means a three-membered structure, a structure that's made out of three separate subunits. Hetero means different, so this means that these heterotrimeric G proteins are going to be made out of three different subunits all bound together. Okay, right. Now, heterotrimeric G proteins uh, are often abbreviated for short as G alpha, beta, gamma because the three uh, separate subunits of the heterotrimeric G protein are called the alpha subunit, the beta subunit, and the gamma subunit. And before I just draw the heterotrimeric G protein, what I want to say is that the important thing about these things is that they can be in two states. Okay, they can be in an on state, and in the on state, they are not actually all bound together. They're not actually as a trimer as a trimer. Okay, instead, they are dissociated into two separate portions. The alpha subunit goes off on its own, and then the beta gamma. Uh, beta and gamma subunits remain bound together as the beta-gamma complex, okay? Now, when they are in the on state, the alpha subunit has GTP bound to it, and this is what results in it being in a conformation where it can no longer interact with the beta-gamma complex. Okay, contrast that then to the off state. In the off state, the alpha subunit has guanosine diphosphate, GDP, bound to it. And in this state, it's in a conformational state where it can interact with the beta-gamma complex. So they are all as a great big trimer called the G-alpha-beta-gamma trimer. Okay, so we are originally going to show the heterotrimeric G protein in this off state where the alpha subunit has the GDP bound to it and therefore all three subunits are bound together. Okay, right, so I'm originally going to show you a really, really simple picture and as I say, we're going to gradually make this more and more complicated. Okay, right, so here is the alpha subunit. Here is my extremely simple picture of the alpha subunit here. Okay, like so. That's the alpha subunit. And it's going to have the guanosine diphosphate bound here. Okay, then we'll have the beta and the gamma subunits bound onto this. So here is the beta subunit, which is the one that interacts with the alpha subunit. And then the gamma subunit is bound to the beta subunit. As we'll see later on, when we draw more advanced pictures of this, the gamma subunit doesn't seem to actually have any contact points with the alpha subunit. Okay, so here is the alpha subunit in red here. Okay, here is the beta subunit in blue here. Okay, and here is the gamma subunit in green. Okay, so the first thing that I want to tell you is that um, the heterotrimeric G protein is not an integral membrane protein, it is a cytoplasmic protein, however it is attached to the cytoplasmic face of the plasma membrane by lipid moieties that have been attached to the alpha subunit and uh, the gamma subunit. Okay, so basically I'll show these now. So uh, the idea here is that you attach on a lipid moiety, a lipid molecule, a fat molecule, okay, that will stick off the side of the protein and that will be extremely hydrophobic. Okay, so it won't like interacting with water molecules, or rather water molecules won't like interacting with it. Okay, so what ends up happening is it ends up forced to implant into the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer, because obviously the core of the phospholipid bilayer is very hydrophobic, so it can sit in there in a thermodynamically favourable state, okay? And that then attaches the alpha subunit dangling underneath the cytoplasmic face of the alpha subunit, 
Okay, so in the case of alpha subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins, the lipid moiety that you get attached is either a palmitoyl group, which is a 16-carbon uh, carboxylic acid group, or it's a myristoyl group, which is a 14-carbon fully saturated carboxylic acid group. Okay, but the important concept, if you don't know what these molecules are, the important concept is that you just have a really long hydrophobic uh, structure sticking off the edge of you, which then has to implant into the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer and then holds the whole protein dangling underneath the uh, phospholipid bilayer. Okay, right. Now, similarly, the gamma subunit also has a lipid moiety attached to it. This is a slightly more complicated lipid moiety. Okay, uh, this can either be what's known as a farnesyl group. Okay, or it can be a geranyl geranyl group. Okay, and these are uh, isoprenyl groups. Okay, they're made by polymerizing uh, isoprene molecules together. Farnesyl is made by polymerizing three isoprene molecules together. Geranyl is the geranyl group. The geranyl geranyl group is made by polymerizing four um, isoprene molecules together. And geranyl geranyl should be one huge word. I just couldn't fit it in there. Okay, right. Uh, so for some gamma subunits, it's a farnesyl group that you've attached there. For some, it's a geranyl geranyl group. Again, the details of the molecular structure of this doesn't matter. What's important is the principle that it's a really long hydrophobic structure that's sticking off the edge of the gamma subunit and which isn't going to be soluble in water at all and which therefore ends up implanting into the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer and therefore holding the gamma subunit dangling underneath the cytoplasmic face of the plasma membrane, basically. That's the important concept. Okay, right. So, here are the heterotrimeric G proteins. The next thing I want to discuss is that there is a huge number of different heterotrimeric G proteins because there are a huge number of different alpha subunits that you can use, there are a huge number of different beta subunits you can use, and there are a huge number of different gamma subunits you can use. And I do want to just go through all of the different alpha, all of the different beta, and all of the different gamma subunits. Now, what's incredible is that although there are, you know, over 800 G-protein coupled receptors, there aren't actually that many alpha subunits, there aren't that many beta, and there aren't that many gamma. So compared to the total number of G-protein coupled receptors, there aren't actually that many um, of the individual subunits here. Of course, when you uh, take into account all the different ways that you could combine these together, that makes a lot more total G protein coupled receptors. But not all of the total combinations of G, sorry, makes a lot more total heterotrimeric G proteins rather than G protein coupled receptors. And um, what I was about to say is that not all of the plausible combinations of alpha, beta, and gamma subunits are actually found in nature. Okay, so uh, you have a huge number of G-protein coupled receptors, but not as many heterotrimeric G-proteins. Okay, so let's go through firstly all of the different alpha subunits, because classically that subunit is certainly seen as the most important subunit. Okay, so there are 16 known genes for alpha subunits, and many of these genes have multiple splice variants, but we're not going to go into the splice variants of them, we're just going to talk about the genes. Of, okay, right, uh, so the genes uh, for um, alpha subunits, okay, so this is 16 genes for alpha. These are going to be arranged into four families, basically. Okay, and the four families that we're going to arrange the uh, G alpha subunits into are the G alpha S family of alpha subunits, okay, the G alpha I slash naught family of alpha subunits, the G alpha Q slash 11 subunit of alpha subunits, and then finally the G alpha 12 slash 13 family of alpha subunits. Okay, so let me show you how we group the 16 genes into these four families. So these are the families for alpha subunits. Okay, right. So we'll start with the G alpha S family up here. 
So G alpha S contains the G alpha S gene itself, okay? A very, very famous alpha subunit of heterotrimeric G proteins, okay? Uh, G alpha S has a huge number of different splice variants, which we're not going to go into, okay? And clearly, its famous actions is that once activated, once it's got GTP bound to it, it then goes off and activates all nine membrane-bound adenylyl cyclase enzymes and results in the production of cyclic AMP. Okay, now there is another alpha subunit uh, of heterotrimet G proteins that does an almost identical thing to G-alpha-S. Again, it activates adenylyl cyclase enzymes. It's slightly less famous than G-alpha-S, and it's called G-alpha-OLF. Okay, and the reason it's called G-alpha-OLF is that it's found in the olfactory epithelium. Okay, and other places besides the olfactory epithelium, but it's very important in the olfactory epithelium. And basically, um, it seems that in certain portions of the body, G alpha OLF is just a substitute for G alpha S, i.e., in certain cells of the body, you don't express G alpha S, instead, you express G alpha OLF, and it does pretty much the same thing as G alpha S, it just takes its place in certain places. And one of the notable places where G alpha OLF takes the place of G alpha S is in the olfactory epithelium. Okay, right, so both of those are grouped into a family together, which is the G-alpha-S family, uh, because they both activate adenylyl cyclase enzymes, so I'll just put AC there for adenylyl cyclase once they're in the on state. Okay, so that's a nice, simple family. G-alpha I slash naught is the most complicated family. This has eight different members, okay? Now, five of them do a very similar thing, okay? Which is that they all inhibit adenylyl cyclase enzymes and therefore reduce the production of cyclic AMP. But then some of them, uh, the Ts, the Ts are also in here, the G-alpha Ts, which are involved in transducing uh, heterotrimeric G proteins, the heterotrimeric G proteins downstream of rhodopsin, uh, those do not inhibit adenylyl cyclase enzymes. Instead, they activate a phosphodiesterase enzyme, specifically phosphodiesterase 6, which breaks down cyclic GMP. So basically, for a different mechanism, they cause cyclic GMP to fall. So that's why we group these all together, basically, because many of them cause cyclic AMP to fall by inhibiting adenylyl cyclases. Some of them then cause uh, cyclic GMP to fall uh, by activating the breakdown of cyclic GMP. Okay, right, so let me tell you the members of G-alpha I slash naught. Okay, so firstly, there are the G-alpha I's. Now, there is not just one G-alpha I. There are three G-alpha I's. There is G-alpha I1, G-alpha I2, and G-alpha I3. And these are not just different splice variants of a, the same gene. No, they are three separate genes coding for different alpha subunits. Okay, yes, all of them pretty much do the exact same thing, which is inhibit adenylyl cyclases, but they are separate genes. Okay, and then you have G alpha O, which again does a very similar thing to all of these three G alpha I's here, and then G alpha Z, which again does quite a similar thing to the four in front of it. Okay, so all of these ones that we've just talked about, G alpha I one to three, whoops, didn't quite mean to go through them like that, uh, G alpha naught and G alpha Z, they all inhibit adenylyl cyclases, so this line at the end means inhibit adenylyl cyclases and therefore cause cyclic AMP to go down. Okay, uh, then, uh, and I put these on a separate line actually, then you have the T's, G alpha T1 and G alpha T2, and these are the alpha subunits of transducing uh, heterotrimeric G proteins. So in the rod and cone cells in your eyes, you have these rhodopsin uh, G protein coupled receptors, which we've discussed now, and when they become active, they activate heterotrimate G proteins, and these heterotrimate G proteins are called transducing proteins when they're in the eye. And basically, they involve these alpha subunits here, okay? Uh, so, in the rod cells, you have what's known as rod transducing, and this involves G alpha T1. And in the cone cells, you have what's known as cone transducing, and this involves G alpha T2. Okay, so that's what those two genes are involved in. They're involved in rod and cone uh, cell transducing, respectively. 
Okay, then finally, the final member of this great family is what's known as G alpha gust. Okay, and that uh, is involved in the gustatory system. Okay, uh, so it's involved in um, transducing signals downstream of those uh, G protein coupled receptors which were involved in the gustatory system. Okay, right. Uh, now, next family, G alpha Q slash 11. Oh, well, actually, let's firstly just see where we are at the moment. Let's take uh, a moment to look at where we've got to. We've now seen eight, uh, sorry, we've seen eight here and two here. So we've seen 10 alpha subunits of heterotranic G proteins in total now. So we've got another six to go. Okay, four of them are going to be in the G alpha Q slash 11 family, and two are then going to be in G alpha 12 slash 13. Okay, so let's now do G alpha Q slash 11. Okay, so the most famous member of the G alpha Q slash 11 family is G alpha Q itself. Okay, uh, it famously activates phospholipase C beta enzymes, leading to the breakdown of phosphatidylinositol 4 5 bisphosphate, which is a membrane phospholipid, into diacylglycerol and inositol 1 4 5 trisphosphate, which then go on to have signaling roles. Okay, however, there are three other alpha subunits that all pretty much do exactly the same thing as G alpha Q. The most closely related structurally is G alpha 11. Okay, so G alpha 11 is pretty much identical to G alpha Q, does the same thing. Okay, so often when people talk about G alpha Q signaling, they'll say G alpha Q slash 11, meaning that we mean either a G alpha Q um, alpha subunit or a G alpha 11 subunit, because often they both are activated by the same G protein coupled receptors and they both go on and do the same thing. Okay, right. But there are even more alpha subunits which then do the same thing as well. Okay, so another one is G-alpha-14. This also activates phospholipase C beta enzymes. And then finally, there is one called G-alpha-15-16. So let me explain why it's called G-alpha-15-16 so you don't get confused into thinking that it's two separate alpha subunits. Okay, so basically, and there were two groups of researchers. One was working in mice and one was working in humans. And the people working in mice, who I think did this first, they found an alpha subunit of heterotrimate G proteins in mice and it was a new one. And they decided to call it G alpha 15. Okay? So G alpha 15 was what it was called in mice. So this is in mice. And then the people working in humans, they found a new alpha subunit of heterotrimate G proteins. And they said, brilliant, I get to name an alpha subunit of heterotrimate G proteins. And they called it G alpha 16, okay, in humans. Okay, later, it transpired that actually these two different alpha subunits, these two different groups had found were actually the same thing. Okay, this was just the mouse version of this, basically. So then there was an argument about whether it should be called G alpha 15 slash 16, and then we settled on calling it G alpha 15 slash 16. Unfortunately, it hasn't really worked. Um, the people working in mice still call it G alpha 15, and the people working in humans still call it G alpha 16. But it would be nice if to show willing you could call it G alpha 15 slash 16. Okay, so that's the origin of why that's called G alpha 15 slash 16. It's not two different alpha subunits. It's one alpha subunit that was given two different names in different species. And then we've combined those two names together to make this new name. Okay, right, so next family, the final family, G alpha 12 slash 13, the family that no one knows anything about. Okay, this contains uh, two members, G alpha 12 and G alpha 13, and both of these are involved in producing cytoskeletal remodeling. Okay, and that's really all I can say about those two. Okay, so that gives us these 16 different genes for alpha subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins. Okay, right. So, uh, two little pieces of nomenclature that I just want to talk about, which are uh, when people talk about G alpha I, if someone just puts G alpha I, that means one of the three here, or maybe all of the three. Okay, it means a G alpha I. So if someone says that a G protein coupled receptor is coupled to G alpha I, heterotrimeric G proteins, that means that it can activate any one of these three, basically. A G protein sorry, that contains uh, one of these three, basically. 
Okay, so that's quite common nomenclature. Okay, also you'll see G alpha T, and again that just means either G alpha T1 or G alpha T2. Okay, uh, so if people talk about G alpha T coupled G protein coupled receptors, it just means that they can activate either G alpha T1 containing heterotrimeric G proteins or G alpha T2 containing heterotrimeric G proteins. Okay, and then the other piece of nomenclature that I told you about at the time, which was uh, G alpha Q slash 11, you'll see this a lot, okay, if you're studying calcium signaling. Okay, so if someone says a G protein coupled receptor activates G alpha Q slash 11 containing heterotrimeric G proteins, what that means is it's a heterotrimeric G protein which either contains G alpha Q or G alpha 11 because they're pretty much identical in sequence. G alpha Q is the most famous one, uh, but G alpha 11 is, does exactly the same thing, is pretty much identical, but is a separate gene product. Okay, right, so those are alpha subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins then. Let's now go on to the beta and gamma subunits, and this is easier. Okay, there are less beta and less gamma subunits. Okay, right, and the naming is simpler as well. Okay, so again, we won't dwell on the different splice variants. Um, there are five different genes for beta subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins, and some of these have multiple splice variants. Okay, uh, so these are called really simply. Okay, they have a really simple nomenclature. They are just beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, beta 4 and beta-5. That is how the naming of beta subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins work. Often you'll see people call these G beta-1, G beta-2, G beta-3, G beta-4, G beta-5, like so. Okay? Right, so that's the different beta subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins. And the classic view of heterotrimeric G proteins is that which beta and which gamma subunit you have doesn't really matter. Okay, but as we'll see, it does actually matter. We'll see that actually when a G protein coupled receptor is activated, it does not just bind to the alpha subunit of the heterotrimeric G protein, it also binds to the beta and gamma subunit, and therefore part of the specificity of the G protein coupled receptor is towards the beta and gamma subunits as well as just the alpha subunits, okay? So the beta and gamma subunits aren't as trivial as you would think, okay? Although it is true that pretty much it doesn't matter which beta and gamma subunit you have as far as the signaling is concerned, or at least our understanding of it at present is that all the different beta gamma complexes kind of do the same thing, okay? That's probably ridiculously naive and will develop in the future. Okay, right, so now let's talk about the gamma subunits. So for gamma subunits, there are 12 genes of gamma subunits. I should just stress again that we have been talking about these in humans, of course. Okay, so 12 genes for gamma in humans. Okay, and their naming is again very simple. It's not quite as beautiful as the beta subunits. There is one little glitch in the naming of the gamma subunits, which is that there is no G gamma 6. Okay, so let me show you the naming. It goes G gamma 1, G gamma 2, all the way up to G gamma 5, okay? But then there is no G gamma 6, so you skip right on to G gamma 7, and then you continue on all the way up to G gamma 13. So you have to go up to G gamma 13 rather than G gamma 12 because we missed G gamma 6 out, okay? So those are the 12 different gamma subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins. Okay, or the 12 genes for gamma subunits. I don't think any of the gamma subunits have been found to have multiple splice variants as of yet. Okay, so that makes the gamma subunits again quite simple. Right, so those are all the different alpha subunits, all the different beta subunits, and all the different gamma subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins. We'll call it there for this video, and in the next video what we will start to move on to is discussing more complicated uh, pictures of what G protein, well, what heterotrimeric G proteins look like. Okay, so we'll start off with a picture that has evolved somewhat from, oh, I've lost it, from the previous picture that we drew here. Okay, and then we will go even further. We will actually look at the structure of the alpha subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins. Okay, so that's what we'll do in the next video.